In just a moment, we want to read from the 22nd chapter of the Gospel according to Luke. And what I want to do tonight is give you that third lesson in this series on prayer. We began by looking at Luke's account of prayer, especially prayers that involve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Sermon number one had to do with the prayer of the Pharisee and the publican. It was a parable that Luke records. And one of the things that we hoped that we gained from that lesson is one must have the right attitude in order for God to answer their prayer. And then we backed up and looked at the 11th chapter of Luke where the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray. And the Lord gave them an outline, what we call the model prayer. Some who are not aware will call it the Lord's Prayer, but we believe that the Lord's Prayer is found in the 17th chapter of John. But in Matthew 6 and Luke 11, Jesus teaches them to pray and the principles of prayer. And then he gave a parable of how to put that prayer in the practice when he talked about a friend who received a friend at the midnight hour and the friend went to his neighbor's house and asked for three loaves of bread. And what I hope we learn from that passage is that God's honor is on the line and we have to have an, an, an avoidance, avoidance of shame that we have to really become naked and transparent before God. And really, we ought to be aware of our nakedness and our transparency because God knows us better than we know ourselves. And he can see not only us, but he can see through us. And when we get to a point in our lives when we can become shamelessness or we want to avoid shame, we can ask God specifically for things that are according to his will and we can have the confidence that not only does he hear us but he will give us the things that we request. Now this third sermon series on prayer is found in the 22nd chapter of Luke beginning with verse number 39. And as he came out and went, as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, pray, that you enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, 
If thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow and said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. From this narrative, I want to use for a subject blood, sweat, and tears. Have you ever wanted something so bad that you could taste it? And it was so close, you could almost reach out and grab it. Yet, it's close, but at the same time, it's far. Have you ever worked hard doing something and then you are so exhausted that you cannot even enjoy the benefits of your labor? I've watched my wife cook when we've had people over a family and many of you can probably relate to this. You're in the kitchen all night long and you're in the kitchen all day long and you are pleased with uh, your results and the dinner is delicious and it smells. Nothing was burnt. Everything was done well. But you put so much effort into what you were doing, you're too exhausted to even enjoy the benefit of what you've done. But I've learned that if a thing is worth having, is worth working hard for, even to the point where you have to shed your blood, your sweat, and your tears. We find in this pericope of scripture a snippet of the toil of our Lord Jesus Christ, a snippet of the anguish that Jesus went through during a critical moment in his life. In this passage, he is praying a prayer. It is an intense prayer. It is a heart desires prayer. But the Lord demonstrated through this prayer that if our prayers are going to be answered, the creature must honor the creator. If our prayers are going to be answered, thus must concede to divinity. If our prayers are going to be answered, the finite must bow down to the almighty. And when we pray, the bottom line is pray that God's will will be done. There is nothing wrong with going to God with your personal requests. But all prayer ought to have a caveat or there ought to be an asterisk. Lord, I want this, but Lord, only if thy will will be done. And I want to show you in this passage that God will send a source of comfort when we submit our will to his will. In this passage, there are three foundational stones that I would like to build this sermonic castle. One is the place of prayer, then the priority of prayer, and then lastly, if time permit, the passion of prayer. 
In this passage, I find the apathy of the disciples. And then we also find the assistance of angels. And in this passage, we would be remiss if we did not talk about the anguish of Jesus. But let's look at the place of prayer. Luke 22, verse 39 and verse 41. And as he came out and went, and as he was wont, or as he was accustomed to, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. Now, Jesus had left the upper room with his disciples and then took three of them to the Garden of Gethsemane that was located on the Mount of Olives. You will find this same narrative in Matthew and in Mark's narrative. And when you put all of them together, you will find that Jesus went to a garden. He call, it's called the Garden of Gethsemane. But he went there to pray. This was his customary place of retirement when in Jerusalem. Jesus had a custom of going in seclusion for a number of reasons. In Mark chapter 6, verses 31 and 32, Jesus told his disciples, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. Jesus was so busy, and he was involved in the lives of others, that he needed some space, and he needed some privacy. So he said unto his disciples, let's, let's go into a desert place. Let's get away from everyday activity. Let's get away from the folk. And we need to rest, not rest forever, but rest to refresh ourselves because there is much work to do. And right now, we are being worn out by the people. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 12, it came to pass in those days that he went into a mountain to pray and he continued all night in prayer to God. In Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 and 23, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. So we find there were times where Jesus and the disciples went to a desert place together to rest. Then we find there are times when Jesus went up into a mountain to pray. And then there are times when Jesus sent his disciples away and he went all by himself and found a solitude place to pray. And I want to say to this audience tonight that we can pray always and not faint. We should be in constant communion with our God and we can pray on the job. We can pray while driving. We can pray sitting at a table, but I do want to say tonight that we ought to find a quiet time to pray. We ought to find a time where, when, when, when we can get away from the hustle and bustle of life. We ought to find a time when there are no distractions, where the TV is turned off, the radio is turned off, and the children are not knocking on the door. There's nothing wrong with praying among friends and praying with someone and praying in a crowd. But I want to share with you, if you really want to have a little talk with Jesus or talk to the Father or whoever you talk to in prayer, you need to get away from everybody and have your own solitary quiet time to pray. Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane located on the west or city side of the mount. It's also called the Mount of Olives. 
and comparing all the accounts of this this scene where he realizes what is about to happen he realizes that he has the weight of the world on his shoulder he leaves nine folk and take three of the twelve with him and he says to them when he gets to the garden when he gets to the Mount of Olives I want y'all to remain here yonder while I go and pray John informs us that when Jesus went to the garden he crossed the Kidron Brook and the name Kidron means a murky or darky place and the word Gethsemane means an olive press so when I put the two words together Jesus has something heavy on his shoulders Jesus has something that's weighing on his mind and Jesus realizes this talk that I'm going to have with my father requires that I have very few distractions this conversation that I'm going to have with my father requires me to be in a dark place it re requires me to be in a murky place it requires me to be in a quiet place and I really believe that every prominent person in scripture all had their private time Moses had it private time with God you remember in Exodus 34 when he went up to the mountain and he and God talked with one another David had his quiet time with God because when he was running from King Saul sometimes he would have to hide in caves and sometimes when he was in that cave all by himself David's soul would cry out that all of his familiar friends were now his enemies I'm saying tonight you and I need to find a quiet place a quiet time where we can talk to God and talk to God all by ourselves Jesus realizes that in just a few hours perhaps that the course of history is about to change and Jesus humanity is speaking out and Jesus realized I need three of my closest friends around me but I don't need them so close that I can't have fellowship with my father. There is going to come a time when the weight of the world is on your shoulder. There's going to come a time when your friends are not close by and you can't reach them on the telephone. But every one of us ought to carve out some quiet time in our lives. I know life is busy. If you got children, you're raised up, it's busy. You send them to school, they come home with homework, they're involved in sports, and you want them to achieve, you want them to do better, you want them to do well, and you're taking them here and you're taking them there. Then you've got your own routine. You get up early in the morning, and you're going to work out, you're going to walk, you're going to run. You come home, and you got to cook dinner, and you got to mow the lawn. There's a whole lot of got-tos in our lives, but I want to add a another got to to your life you ought to have a got to to have some quiet time with the Lord don't get so busy where you and the Lord can't have fellowship and Jesus realized that at this point I need to talk to God and I need a place where I can pray and then I see the priority of prayer because in verse 40 and when he was at the place, he said unto them, pray that you enter not into temptation. But watch how many times Jesus uses the word prayer or Luke records the word prayer. In Luke 22, 40, pray that you enter not into temptation. In Luke 22, 41, he kneeled down and prayed. In Luke 22, 44, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Luke 22, verse 45, he rose up from prayer. Luke 22, verse 46, rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. When Jesus came to this garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus came to the Mount of Olives, there was one thing on his mind. And the one thing on his mind is prayer is a priority.
And if we are going to shake the thrones of heaven, if things are going to change in our life, not only must we find a place to pray, but we must make prayer a priority in our lives. Paul said in 1 Timothy 2 and verse number 1, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Paul mentioned four types of prayers in 1 Timothy 2 and 1, and I just want to talk about three of them. Uh, he uses the word supplication. And supplication carries the idea of offering a request for a felt need. That's what Jesus is doing in Luke 22. He's offering a request. He's making a request. He, he's not asking them or the three, Peter, James, and John, to pray on his behalf. This is his request on his own. Then there's another prayer, a general prayer, which just emphasizes the sacredness of prayer. But then there's the word intercession. And to intercede, the basic meaning is to draw near to a person. And then after you draw near to that person, to conversate confidentially with that person. There are some prayers. There are some private prayers. There are some quiet time prayers. When we talk to God and we're talking about some personal and private things. We're talking about some things that we haven't told anybody else. We're talking about some things based on our relationship with God. I haven't told my mama. I haven't told my daddy. I haven't told my husband or my wife. I haven't told my children. There's something that nobody knows but me and the Lord. That's how close you got to get to God. That you can tell him what's on your mind. You can tell him what's on your heart. You can tell him what your desires are. You may not share it with the leadership of the church. You may not share it with the preacher. You may not share it with your spouse. But when you set aside some time to God and you intercede, you are entering a fellowship and drawing near and you are confidentially conversating with God because there's something important on your heart. This is what part of what Jesus is doing, supplication and interceding. He's interceding on behalf of himself. He's, su he's supplying or going to God with supplication, asking the Lord to remove something from his life. And prayer ought to be a priority in our lives, not just when we are in trouble, not just in case of emergency, not just when we hear bad news, not when we anticipate the worst to happen, but all of us ought to be so close to God that we can talk to God about anything thing at any time. Uh, that's what Paul meant when he used the word intercession in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. But I also see uh, the passion of this prayer. And one of the things I want you to notice is all through this prayer, uh, uh, Mark, Matthew and Mark brings out the points that Jesus prayed the same prayer three times. And in the middle midst of his prayer, he goes back to the disciples. And when he goes back to his disciples, the three, he finds them asleep. Now, he didn't want them sleeping. He wanted them to be awake. But for whatever reason, they could not keep their eyes open for one hour. And uh, uh, Jesus uh, had something to say about that. But then in the midst of all of this, he's about to pray a passionate prayer. Before he can enter into that passionate prayer, the Bible lets us know that the angels came to give him some encouragement. In verse 42, well, he's kneeled down and he's praying now in verse 41. And in verse 42, his prayer is, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. The question must come to the floor, what cup is the Lord talking about? He had just instituted 
what we call the Lord's Supper earlier where they took the cup but that's not the cup he's praying about right now he is talking about his cup of suffering he realizes that the, the plan was that he would leave heaven, he would take on the form of man, he would be in the likeness of man, he would feel what we feel, he would experience what we experience, and he realized that the plan that he and God had before the foundation of the world was that he would come to this earth, be in human form, but he would die, and he would die a shameless death, he would suffer as he died, and now the hour is upon him, and now he realizes that all that he and the father had planned is about to come to pass but you have to realize there's two sides of Jesus he's God but he's also God in the flesh uh, before we close uh, we would be remiss if we did not give you God's plan of saving you it starts by hearing and believing that Jesus Christ is the son of God that he died on Calvary was buried but rose from the grave on the third day. If you repent of past sins, confess that Jesus is the Christ, then you are a candidate who can be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. When you do that, God adds you to, to his church. We are very thankful that you watched us today. Until next week, may God bless you and may he bless you real good. Lord, I see a man, see a man standing, standing by the Jordan. Why do you teach? Oh, Lord, from everybody's eyes. I see a man, I see a man and he's standing, standing by the Jordan. Why do you teach? From everybody's eyes. Oh, I never knew. I never knew. I never knew what man.